Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to carry on. Anybody else that comes in can join us. I appreciate your time. Hopefully, we can uh, can share some uh, decent content with you in terms of a discussion, a workshop, and uh, panning through the challenges around what happens once you've had a ransomware attack and how you can, how you can survive that and overcome it and uh, continue in your business from a functionality operational point of view. My name is Faroz Jaffa. I'm from First Technology, the CTO. There's some new names on the call uh, today, which I've not met yet, so I look forward to meeting you in future. Uh, usually, I, I love interacting with customers and, and see them in person. I know it's a bit more challenging today in these times, but we are getting out a bit more nowadays, but video calls work just as well in the interim. Um, just some house rules. Uh, I don't have to tell you where's the bathroom, because most of you are probably at home and you should know where that is. Uh, from a, a, a mute perspective, I can ask you please to stay on mute and keep video off for now. I'm uh, very happy for you to put video on a little bit later. Our agenda will we'll go through a, a short presentation by the guys from Veeam, the Veeam team. Ian Engelbrecht, who is the senior systems engineer, and uh, we work quite closely with him and uh, Darren as well. And Russell is also on the call. Those are the three representatives from a Veeam perspective. Uh, the point of uh, that presentation is to just create some framework and a common understanding of, of the industry, the challenges, and, and some of the solutions as well. Post that, we will break into an interactive uh, workshop with a panel of people, the panel presented by um, Ian and, um, and Rian from our side. Rian is one of our skilled uh, system engineers on the Veeam side and has a lot of experience with projects big and small and also one of the few uh, architects in the country. And uh, that panel will be open to everybody to partake and uh, draw some information from. So I'd like to entice people at that point in time to be very participative, participative and, uh, and ask your questions. Uh, as we say in the old days, there's uh, no uh, stupid questions. There can be stupid answers though, but hopefully you're not going to get any of those from us. So what I'd like to do at this point in time is hand over to, to Ian and uh, Darren to, uh, to kind of position uh, we are in this uh, challenge and then we can go into a panel. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thanks for that intro, Feroz. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. Um, so I'm Darren Naidu, the Partner Manager um, at Beam Software South Africa, looking after First Technology. So today what I want to do is just give you a very brief overview of where we are in terms of Beam as a company before we break into um, the ransomware discussion. So just some very important points to note where, with, with regards to Beam. Um, we have a, a holistic solution that delivers for the virtual, physical, software as a service, and cloud platforms. So uh, we support multiple hypervisors from VMware, Hyper-V to uh, an Acropolis perspective. Uh, from a physical layer, we look after Windows, Linux, as well as Oracle, um, and when it comes to software as a service, we've got solutions that cover your Office 365 applications very well, ensuring that you are protected and, in, and meeting compliance from that aspect. Or even if your journey is moving towards one of the hyperscalers like a Microsoft Azure or an AWS, an IBM Cloud, you'll still have your trusted backup vendor or data management vendor who will look after you in those areas as well. Another important point to note is that um, we don't have uh, proprietary hardware that we sell on to our customers. We will work with the hardware that's already in place. So we've got alliances um, with the likes of HPEs, Nutanix, Lenovo's, Cisco's, Pure Storages. So most of the major um, hardware vendors, or storage vendors, we do have um, integrations into their appliances and we're able to leverage uh, their technology like snapshot technology to deliver uh, faster RPOs and RTOs for your business. So like I said, we, we take a holistic approach to cloud data management and um, everything that we do is aimed at not one of not a single pillar, but looking at it from a um, overall view. So whether it's backup and recovery to cloud mobility, monitoring and analytics, orchestration and automation, automation as well as governance and compliance, we will cover you um, in all of those areas of your business. Now, for a long time, I think the perception has been that Veeam is a um, virtual only application, but as you've seen from uh, my previous slide, we cover you 
um, regardless of whether it's virtual, physical, or, or cloud instances. Um, if we just delve a little bit into backup and recovery, which is the, the core foundation of our product, it's simple to use reliable software, um, and uh, it's also application aware, so we can give you granular and verified backups. Now, when we say verified backups, um, I think Ian may delve a little bit into that uh, a little later on with regards to the data lab uh, portion, but that is proprietary software from Veeam. Uh, it's patented technology from Veeam. So no other backup vendor can offer you that, um, the way that we verify our backups. Um, and, and this is done on an automated basis as well. A lot of the times people may ask, or um, certainly I ask my customers, you know, how often do you actually back or test your backups or verify that you're, that you're recoverable from, from your backups? Um, the SLAs say that it's got to be tested at least once a month. But in reality, it's as and when we have time which is not ideal because often you only find out that the backup's not recoverable when you need it. And that's the wrong time to be finding that out. So with Veeam, we're able to automate that process, provide reports back so you can provide feedback to the business saying that you are meeting the SLAs in terms of testing your backups and you are recoverable from it. And if we just look a little bit at cloud mobility, now, for a long time, uh, moving to a hyperscaler was always seen as a risky option, um, not just from a bandwidth perspective, but also because of vendor locking, right? We called it the Hotel California effect. You can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. So how do you mitigate from this type of risk? One way of doing it is backing up that data by using Veeam. So we are able to back up your cloud um, workloads and restore them anywhere you want. So, uh, which means that, you know, if you sit in sort of uh, AWS and you want to move to an Azure, we're able to move you to a different location. Or if you decided that your journey to the cloud was uh, not what you wanted it to, or not what you expected it to be, and you're going to come back on premise, you can easily restore those workloads back on premise. So moving over to monitoring and analytics, we're able to monitor, diagnose, and remedi remediate unexpected issues for critical backup and DR processes using AI-driven monitoring and diagnostics. So there's intelligence even built into our monitoring and analytics where we're able to um, anticipate issues within your environment and remediate them without you having to, to take any action. Um, so that, and, and there'll be continuous enhancements as we progress in, in, in that AI space as well. If we look at automation, so you can really be able to leverage your well-managed data to unlock greater business value for you, right? We can test and orchestrate your business continuity and DR operations, um, ensuring that you can recover from any event. Um, we're able to interrogate um, Oh, sorry, integrate migration and DevOps capabilities, enabling data reuse. So it's not just about backing up your data, but what can we do with the data that you already have? Um, because we see that there's a lot more value in it. We're able to do test and dev on it. We're able to um, interrogate it for uh, various uses, whatever you may decide to that you want to use. And, and we have open APIs that integrate into this platform uh, so you can write your own um, applications to in interrogate this data. And governance and compliance, right? Ensure your application security, compliance, and privacy requirements are met before you restore a workload or move a workload into a production environment. Because often we find that um, when you recover from a backup, the compliance requirements in your production environment may have changed. So how do we how do we keep up with those changes and how do we ensure that we maintain that state of compliance as what was set in production? One way of doing that is leveraging that data labs technology, which I mentioned earlier is patented technology by, by Veeam. So just very quickly, Veeam in, in numbers, a little bit of bragging. So I do apologize for this. We will get into the meat of the discussion very shortly. Um, but this is just to show you that you are dealing with a trusted vendor when it comes to data management. 
um, 76% of global uh, Fortune 500s trust Veeam. We've got over 365,000 customers, um, and, and that number is continuously growing. Um, we've, we, we, we are you know, present in over 160 countries and over 4,100 employees. So even during these, these trying times, um, we're able to still grow the business and ensure that we meet our customers' uh, expectations. So if you look on the bottom uh, left corner of your screen, you'll see the uh, industry average for customer satisfaction. We're 3.5 3 times above um, the industry average. So if you're not already using Veeam, um, you can be rest assured that um, you are back in a, a winning horse. So um, I will now hand over to um, Ian. Uh, we'll cover the ransomware portion of the of the slide. Over to, over to you, Ian. Thanks, Darren. Can you see my screen? We see it. Here we go. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah, thanks, Darren. Um, so I'm Ian Engelbrecht, uh, Senior System Engineer for Veeam for Africa. And, um, yeah, today just going through some of the challenges that you might see with ransomware as well as what Veeam is doing to help you protect your data and recover from a ransomware attack. So to start, you know, what, what is ransomware? I'm sure everyone hears the word ransomware. I, I think a lot of people understand what ransomware is, uh, plainly, plainly said, and um, on a high level, a ransomware is is a malware that's can, going to lock your data, steal your data, and make it unusable and keep it for ransom, and then ask you to then pay to get that data back. Um, you know, there are some free decryption tools that you can find online for older strains of ransomware to try and decrypt them. A lot of times, these are just another cyber criminal uh, using you know, using that ability to actually further further infect your infrastructure by, by providing you with a fake decryption tool. They shouldn't be trusted and you can't rely on such tools, right? It's, it's key to understand that ransomware syndicates should be treated as if they were fully fledged uh, tech companies. Um, they have been successful in getting payments uh, and ransoms from customers and large customers. They use that money to further enhance their syndicates, uh, more infrastructure, R&D, so on, further developing their payloads uh, to exploit more customer data. So it's very hard to stay ahead of these gangs from a, from a security perspective. And we need to ensure that we have a last line of defense. And this is where we speak about Veeam's best practice and how Veeam fits in the picture to be your last level of defense. So first, from a best practice and what Veeam um, suggests is that you master a three to one rule. Veeam adds additional zero, which I'm gonna speak about. So we believe in a three to one zero rule. Um, run risk assessments with Veeam one. And I'm going to go into further detail on how that works with Veeam One, as well as safeguard your backup infrastructure, because a lot of these newer payloads are, are attacking your backup infrastructure before they even start encrypting your data, making sure that you have no ability to recover at the time that they've held your data ransom. So if we look at what the 3210 rule is, this is something that Veeam uh, believes in. There's three different copies of your data, right? Sitting on two different media sets, so two, two different types of storage medium, uh, one being off-site and zero errors on all of those backups. So you've ensured that all, the three, two, one copies of the backup are all recoverable and you've verified that fact. So the, the rule doesn't help if, you know, one of the media or one of the copies of data are, are um, corrupt or unusable or non-restorable, that just defeats the point of the three to one rule. So what Veeam's gonna, gonna give you or further enhance this rule is zero errors across the three to one. One of the biggest shortcomings of that three to one rule is that um, the offsite copy in a lot of um, scenarios is not air-gapped. So 
you could have three copies of the data, two sitting on two different types of storage and one being off-site, but they're all networked to the backup server. What we've seen in, in recent uh, ransomware attacks is the ability to actually find and discover backup and or network targets connected to a backup infrastructure. You know, all copies of your data that sit inside your 3 2, one rule can be compromised by a, a ransomware gang. So the best practice from Veeam's point of view is at least one of the copies needs to be offline or air-gapped uh, from the backup infrastructure. This most com commonly is done using tape or removable uh, disk, right? But in the presentation, I'll speak about other solutions that you could use um, that could give you a similar approach making your backups air gapped. So air gapped storage types, you can use tape, which is most commonly used uh, offline when written to, because once you write to a tape, it's generally ejected and the tape is, is sent off site. For that backup data to be held ransom, the cyber criminal will have to physically have access to that tape device, which is very unlikely. A uh, replicated VM sitting in a different subnet or different data center powered off um, can also have a different authentication framework, which means sitting, sitting on a different domain. If, um, your, if the cyber criminal gains access to your infrastructure via compromised um, credentials, you could have a separate domain sitting in DR that has not been compromised and doesn't allow that compromised account to log in. This could be regarded as a, a, an off or an air gapped or offline copy because you have a replicated copy sitting in a different data center that has no relationship with production. Primary store, storage uh, snapshots. Um, so Veeam's plugins integrating into uh, primary storage vendors. Um, there's a large list of, of who they are. Creating snapshots on those storage devices themselves, bringing the snapshot off of the virtual platform or off of the network and sitting on the storage network can also uh, air gap a, back, a, a backup um, or copy of the data. Basically, there's a snapshot of the VMs um, sitting on a storage array rather than sitting on a network or network storage. This can also be on a different authentication framework because logging into the storage device could be different to logging into a VM or logging into uh, virtual infrastructure. Uh, Veeam Cloud Connect backup. So Veeam runs a Cloud Connect cloud provider program where um, partners run their own private clouds and can create a Veeam backup target by running Veeam software and then provide this as a multi-tenant solution to different Veeam customers. This backup can also be considered air gap because it sits off site, it sits in a um, it sits in a partner's infrastructure or cloud infrastructure and they will take the necessary means to make that uh, that redundant with inside their infrastructure. Rotating hard drives. This is also uh, a solution through Veeam. You could, rather than choose tape to write to, you could use uh, external drives or multiple um, disk drives that you could rotate your backup copies to. Um, so you could write to a single drive today and take that drive and actually sit it, put it off-site. So you could treat a, a physical hard drive the same way you do with your tape. So going further into that, how Veeam One can help you rescue um, or alert you on, on your infrastructure based on ransomware activity. So Veeam One has a few capabilities when it comes to ransomware. One of them which is, which is quite important, being the alerting of possible ransomware activity in your infrastructure. So Veeam One, doing the analytics and reporting and monitoring on your virtual infrastructure, basically we are collecting all the usage data and performance metrics from VMs of a point in time. So we can take a um, activity of a VM based on a certain period, and then we can determine that uh, if a VM spikes above its average usage, what we've determined, then it could be a possible ransomware activity. So simply said, we can say if a VM goes past um, its certain threshold on CPU usage or uh, memory usage, then we can flag this as possible ransomware activity. What we can then do is have an action based on that rule 
that can remediate. So we flag a VM as possible ransomware activity because we've seen a spike and increase in disk IO, memory and CPU usage, which could relate to encryption tasks running inside the, the VM. The action can run and say immediately take it off the network so it doesn't further infect any other VMs in the infrastructure or immediately begin an instant VM restore from Veeam and bring up another copy. Um, there's a lot of different scenarios we can use with remediation actions. Additionally, we have another report that can look at backup file growth and determine if the change rate has spiked over its normal usage. So what we've seen is that a lot of ransomware uh, payloads have become more intelligent. What they can do is do a, a sort of silent encrypt, which is a very uh, low CPU intensive encryption into the, the, um, the file system so that it doesn't get flagged. So your CPU usage won't spike, your memory usage won't spike, your disk IO won't, stop, won't spike because it's, encrypt, it's encrypting the files at such a slow rate. Uh, this is one way that they can hide from certain monitoring and uh, security tools. So what Veeam has done is added an additional reporting tool that will check the change rate of the VM. Because the ransomware strain is actually um, encrypting files, this is viewed as change on a block level, right? Because a file has changed. When we run a backup, we suddenly observe this huge amount of growth and it's not normal because we've been observing a certain percentage of growth over the past X days or weeks. And suddenly we see this huge spike and we compare that against a full backup. And if this flags as suspicious, we then report possible ransomware activity based on change rates of a backup. And then again, on that rule, you can have a remediation action, which means immediately disconnect your backup infrastructure from, from uh, production infrastructure to to not further spread the ransomware activity uh, or remove the VM or power down the VM, disconnect it or immediately initiate restores for that VM. This can all be automated through Veeam 1 and Veeam backup and replication. So this is an example of suspicious incremental backup size. We're flagging, we're seeing that this incremental is way too big from what we're expecting because we've been seeing the incremental backups for this VM over time and this passes certain metrics and uh, we flag it then as a suspicious incremental. So this is to safeguard if you have a certain strain of ransomware that is trying to go undetected and do uh, low level encryption, um, trying to pass undetected in your infrastructure, then we will see this as disk change rate in backup and alert on this as well. One of the key things when it comes to ransomware I mean, you could have the best security products, you could have the best backup um, products in your infrastructure. Um, but one of the key things is to, to educate your users and admins inside the infrastructure. There's best practices, there's ways that you can avoid um, allowing access into your, your infrastructure just by educating the users not to do certain things and to be uh, more pertinent on, on information and emails and links that are received to them. So this is an example of a ransomware uh, attack that's already been done. This is then the instructions on how to actually pay the ransom, right? At uh, this point, you know, it's too late. Data is encrypted. You need to start looking at backup. Where edu education comes in, and this is just an example in a lot of different uh, presentations that I've done. Uh, I have different screenshots of different types of uh, phishing emails that cyber uh, criminals can send through to a user to trick them. And they, they've become more and more believable. So if you look at this, this email and this screenshot of this email, I mean, it looks like it legit comes from uh, Amazon. It's got Amazon's logos. It's got their layout. It looks like it's asking the customer to reset his uh, Amazon account. The only thing that gives it away is obviously the email address. And that's something that a user might overlook and they might just read the email. There's a busy day and suddenly they click on the link and they've then provided um, the cyber criminal with their credentials into the Amazon account. And, and from there they can start encrypting or stealing data or locking data and holding you ransom, right? So your user is your worst enemy essentially in your infrastructure. And it starts with basic training and educating the users to be more 
uh, security conscious. And then of course we need to put certain uh, failbacks in place like have security first line defense and then having backup and data protection last line defense. But in between you need that um, education of the users to ensure that they don't uh, allow uh, access into the infrastructure by mistake. The threat is very real and Veeam support helps you guide or helps guide customers through ransomware attacks every single day. Uh, we have proof of that. We actually have a specific team that operationally deals with these types of support calls. Uh, this is posts on our forum. We see this on a daily basis about customers being hacked and data being stolen, encrypted. And most of the times we can get this data back because they're running Veeam and they're, they're adhering to our best practice from a data perspective. So Veeam's objective is to give you resilience on your data and ensure the ability to recover if something goes wrong. So deep diving into the actual features and key features that are going to help you from a ransomware perspective. If you don't know these features already, Veeam has the ability to do an instant VM restore, which is quickly restoring a VM just by mounting a backup file. So rather than having to actually copy that VM's image out of backup into production and then bring it online, we can make it instantly available just by mounting it to a virtual infrastructure. Veeam has purpose-built Veeam explorers for specific applications, the likes of SQL, uh, Exchange, SharePoint, um, file servers, um, Oracle, the list goes on. And this will help you restore individual application data rather than having to bring up an entire uh, virtual machine or subset of virtual machines. So if um, a specific application was attacked, we could restore the application data rather than having to bring all the infrastructure back up to get the application back up. We have the ability to do an instant file level recovery, which means mounting the backup and bringing the files online and immediately available and then putting them into infrastructure. As well as we have the failback options for you to restore your infrastructure into the likes of Azure or AWS. If you were attacked and your entire infrastructure was compromised, you have the ability to quickly um, utilize your Azure subscription or AWS subscription and their infrastructure as a service offering to bring up the compromised virtual infrastructure on-prem. A key um, or key practice with Veeam is how Veeam components work. So Veeam has multiple different components. Uh, we have a SQL DB uh, that holds our configuration for jobs. So jobs and scheduling. We have a console which is your day-to-day -day access into your backup infrastructure where you would um, have a GUI to view the backup jobs and statistics and so on. We would have a repository, which is your backup storage that you're writing your backups to. And then we have proxies, which are our scale out component that allows us to increase um, compute for backup and decrease compute for backup. The proxies are the backup engine. This is where we offload our backup tasks to. Now, this can be a all in one installation. Right, so we can have a single server that runs console, SQL DB, repository, and uh, proxy all in one. The problem comes along when this server's credentials have been compromised. You've now suddenly um, put every single, you will, you've put all the backup infrastructure in a single failure point. And this single server's um, credentials get compromised. This is your entire backup infrastructure has been compromised. So you can, um, in stages, break this out and scale out the infrastructure, all right? So decentralize everything. You have a console separately. You can have a SQL database separately. You can run proxies, multiple or singular, um, for load balancing. And then you can split out the repository server as well. So these different components can be separated. And this then reduces um, your risk from a backup infrastructure. So if a single credential is compromised, it's possibility that they only compromised your console server and um, you've just lost GUI access to your backup, your backup infrastructure. We can quickly spin up a new console and you still have access to your backup infrastructure and so on. And this is, this is the idea, the best practice to try and place the components of your backup infrastructure individually, span them out, access um,
for the attack vector if something was compromised. Going into one of the key features that I explained, which is the instant VM recovery and how this works. So like I said, VM back up in minutes, we observe a failed VM. What Veeam does is use a vPower service, which is basically uh, creating an NFS mount to your hypervisor of choice uh, and then bringing up a VM instantly. So what happens is in the hypervisor, you see, immediately see a new data store and that data store is actually a location on the backup storage. And we then present VM files to the hypervisor and bring the VM up within minutes. Then in the background, what would happen is you do like a storage vMotion or storage move, which would copy that VM's disk from backup storage data store to production storage data store, right? The key here is that we can bring that VM up immediately and users can start using it or the application can become available within minutes. And then in the back end, we can do the task of the actual copy from backup storage to production. Another key feature is Veeam's data labs. Now, Veeam's data labs is, is providing a virtual infrastructure to Veeam to run certain uh, tests and features against. So you would create a data lab, which would be a single host or cluster of hosts uh, that would have storage, computer, networking. You would provide that to Veeam and Veeam would utilize that uh, to run certain features against. One of those being sandboxing on demand. So we could immediately spin up a copy of any set, set of VMs or single VM into this location and you could then do on-demand sandboxing. So DevOps, dev testing, uh, security, DevSec, um, you could do business uh, intelligence against the analytics and so on, whatever the use case is. It could purely be testing upgrades or patches on a certain application. We then also can do sure backup and sure replica. So Veeam is doing your backups. And then how do we test that these backups are restorable and the integrity is still there? Veeam will spin up a copy of that backup into this data lab um, and then run a certain amount of tests against it. So we will make sure that the VM boots, we'll make sure that we get to control out the lead screen. We'll make sure that uh, we get a heartbeat from with inside the guest operating system via the tools. Um, we will then also check is it pingable on the network. We can then further check does a SQL server start? Does an exchange server start? We can run uh, custom queries against databases to ensure that they are transactional, right? At that point, once it passed all those specific tests, we can then remove it and, um, and send your report. So you're not, what's key here is you're, you're using the instant VM technology for all of these features. You're not using additional storage to do your DevOps dev test, to do your backup verification, and your replica verification. You're not using additional storage. We're just using what's already in backup, mounting it into a data lab, and uh, doing on-demand sandboxing, show backup, show replica. Stage restore is another feature, very similar. We're mounting a backup into data labs before we restore it into production. The key use case here is to remove information uh, information into that VM before we put it into production. So it could be um, GDPR purposes, uh, removing users out of an AD database before we put that AD into production. It could be um, you've changed antivirus providers, injecting the new antivirus package into that VM before we put it into production. So in the restore process, we'll have stage restore in the middle where we bring up the VM into a data lab location, inject or remove the data, and then put it into production. And lastly, secure restore. Secure restore being the ability to actually um, do antivirus scans against the backup before we restore it into production. And I'll go into more detail on how that works in the coming slides. So the use cases, as already mentioned, for Veeam Data Labs, um, increasing innovation by doing um, on production copies of your data. So taking copies of production, spinning it up into data labs, and then testing new applications, new products, uh, innovating on your current application uh, stack. Uh, improving your, your development operations, your IT services and operations by bringing this up into isolated data labs and doing testing, testing security vulnerabilities, maybe doing some uh, penetration, pen uh, sorry, penetration testing against uh, VMs brought up into the, the data lab rather than having to try and, and, and um, hack your infrastructure production. 
compliance and analytics, running certain tools against copies of your production in data labs, uh, disaster recovery simulation as well. So we look at what the Secure Restore is. Secure Restore is available through these different restore scenarios from Veeam. So if you did an instant VM restore, which I showed you earlier, you can tick Secure Restore. So it would stage it and then do an AV scan and then bring it up in production immediately. So you could also do a full restore, which is copying from backup to production, but in between we do secure um, AV scan. Uh, you could do a Veeam Direct Restore to Azure or AWS, but before we put it in Azure or AWS, we could do an AV scan. We could restore just a virtual disk to a VM rather than the entire VM. And in that process, we could also scan that virtual disk before we attach to the production VM, as well as exporting backups to, um, of agents as virtual disks or doing volume level restores back to physical servers. We can do a scan of those backups before we do those restore processes. This is how the secure restore actually works. So you've got your backup repository, which is holding the backup information, and you have the backup server, which is controlling all backups. We basically mount the backup point that you've chosen to restore. And once it's mounted, we do an AV scan against the file system, and we use your preferred AV product. Once we've scanned and we detect there's no infections, we continue with this and we bring up the VM in production. Uh, if we find infections, you have the ability to say, okay, continue with the restore, but disconnect it from the network so that it doesn't spread that infection. And then you can go in and deal with the infection um, via console access into the VM, but it stays isolated. Or we can drop the restore process completely because we found an infection. Now, what's key that I didn't, didn't mention is that Ransomware is spread through different types of malware. So generally, uh, cyber criminals and um, cyber syn uh, criminal syndicates will try and penetrate your infrastructure first. And once they have access or gained access to your infrastructure, then start moving ransomware payloads in and infecting and spreading into your infrastructure. Now, they could use the likes of worms um, and certain toolkits and rootkits spread infections and break vulnerabilities or find vulnerabilities in uh, or missing security updates, so on, and exploit certain gaps in, in your infrastructure, right? So you're taking backups of virtual machines that could potentially be holding uh, infections. You have a ransomware infection a week later, because this is when they initiated the encryption process, but you're unaware that you've been backing up these VMs throughout the week. So you have copies of potential malware sitting inside a backup image. You are hit with ransomware today. We recover everything. Everything's great. Um, but what you recovered was a VM that could have some kind of malware on it that then brought ransomware into the infrastructure. So you've recovered from, you've recovered your data and it's unencrypted, but it still holds the malware that has the ability to encrypt it again. So this hence why we have a secure restore process. This. If you suspected some kind of malware or uh, attack in your infrastructure, we would suggest run a secure restore if replacing infrastructure VM and ensure that there are no vulnerabilities on that VM before putting it back into, pr into production. Moving on to air gap backups. I did speak about air, back gap up, uh, sorry, air gap backups and uh, most of the commonly used were rotating disks um, as well as tape. Now, S3 has become quite popular, and this is object uh, storage, right? That is presented to you either via Amazon or you could use Azure Blob Storage, or there's a lot of S3 compatible storage providers. Google also provides S3 access to object storage. Uh, there are some on-prem devices that have S3 API that also act as object storage. So S3 has become quite popular in the backup realm at the moment. Storing data into object storage, um, into buckets and so on, is still, is still vulnerable to an attack because the API um, is connected to the backup um, solution. So if a cyber criminal at your backup software or your backup server, sorry, and act, gained access to your backup software, you could potentially see backup sitting on disk-based storage, backup sitting on object-based storage, even though it would, the backups were put there via API, the backup storage 
might have cache credentials for that object storage, and you, he could have the ability to delete data that is sitting inside the object repository. So to prevent that, we introduce an object lock. So Amazon S3 has ability to enable immutability. And basically what that does is it locks the bucket. So from a Veeam perspective, what we do is we write backup data to a block-based tier, which we call performance tier. We then move or copy data into object storage. Um, and then that object storage, if it has immutability enabled, it will lock the, the bucket. And what this does, okay, what this does is it, it creates essentially a worm device. So write once, read many. So the block data that we've moved into the object bucket that has now been locked for a certain period of time cannot be deleted, right? It can be read, so we can still restore from it, but it cannot be overwritten, it cannot be changed. So from a, a cyber criminal perspective, if you hacked your back product, if you gained access to your object storage, you would be unable to delete it. You'll be unable to change your backup data. You would only um, be able to see it and, and that, that's where it ends. So he could delete everything on your performance tier, on your block-based storage devices, but you would not be able to delete uh, your copy sitting in object storage if it, it had immutability enabled um, through an object lock. Another way to, to sort of safeguard you is to try and use different backup repositories. So Linux-based repositories or deduplication appliances. These have different protocols in how the Beam product accesses these storage devices. So it keeps the cyber criminals guessing. You know, they, they generally have a payload that will go and scan across the network on certain protocols to find uh, certain exploits, and they might skip uh, some kind of uh, protocol that we integrate in a certain um, um, hardware vendor or DDoP appliance. So using a Linux-based server with JBOD um, using an extra, de extra grid device where we actually have a data mover on the device um, or HP store once using Catalyst that we actually use Catalyst process to move our data onto the device or using a Dell EMC data domain where we use DD Boost to move the data onto the device. Um, the, the payload that the hacker might send into the infrastructure might not be aware or familiar with these processes and then might skip these backup copies. So a must, a must have in your infrastructure is obviously to encrypt your data, right? Having backup data encryption is an additional safeguard against ransomware because ransomware is not just about encrypting your backup data. A lot of cases, ran, uh, ransomware syndicates will steal your data and then threaten to expose certain sensitive data online um, unless you pay them. In that essence, there's, there's not much you can do to get your data back from him, but to avoid this, having encryption enabled on your backup data will safeguard you against this. They could steal your backup information but and copies of your production data, but they would have to do it. They wouldn't be able to use it. They would be able to, to hold your ransom to that data. So Veeam will encrypt in flight, so from uh, the backup source to backup target, and we will encrypt at rest, which means the actual backup data is sitting in a repository encrypted, right? So we have a lot of content around ransomware. Uh, you can scan the QR code here. Um, you can read online. I mean, I've just touched on a few topics. There are a series of white papers that go in depth into how to safeguard yourself and best practices against ransomware. Um, it, from a general general purpose as well as from a Veeam perspective. And that brings me to the end of the presentation. Okay, thank you, Ian. That was, I think, uh, quite informative and, uh, and in some essence quite technical. I think some of the people in the audience are, are risk managers or looking at it from a, a business perspective, not technical, but I think the, the foundation of it is quite valid to the team that's present. So I've got a couple of questions of things in my mind that, that, that kind of spurs on a conversation. But I think before we go there, if anybody in the audience, and I welcome the audience to turn on video if you want to interact, that's uh, voluntary, um, to ask any questions they might have. There might have been something in the, in, the, in the presentation or a thought that wasn't addressed. 
that's uh, in your mind that you want to post or ask. You can either ask in person or you can post it in the chat. I, I don't mind either way. We've got uh, Ian still on screen and we've got Rian also on screen. Um, and so they are the, the specialists around this particular area. Remember, we, we're not speaking from a, a, a ransomware prevention entirely, even though there's components to this, that that's a security conversation and we can certainly have that. Uh, there's a lot of tools available, a lot of processes available to the area we focus on. But coming back to this, what happens when there's an incident? How do I avoid the incident? How do I avoid a repeat incident? I think that's a, a very interesting conversation that Ian has raised, that even though you may recover, but inside your backups, there could still be a zero day threat looming. And uh, and when you recover, you recover that threat as well, obviously. So if I can ask the audience if you've got any questions to, to post to ask. So just just a comment uh, very quickly for us. So um, a lot of the times when, when companies are hit by ransomware attacks, um, they, they quite often pay the bribe. Um, and this does pose uh, you know multiple issues as well. So for one, you're not guaranteed to get your data back. And the other is that you are funding a criminal um, organization. So um, you know I think Ian shared an, uh, an article with me the other day where this in, in the States, they're actually making it illegal to pay bribes. So that, that could put your, your business at risk as well. Um, so the, the ideal is to try and mitigate the risk and try and avoid or put, put measures in place to avoid these type of attacks. 100%. So, so on that same note, I mean, uh, not so long ago, I think it was probably about uh, four to six weeks ago, we saw the Garmin article hit the press. And for those of you who use Garmin devices for navigation or exercise, it's quite common from an exercise smartwatch perspective, you were all offline. Um, and that, that's a case where, where Garmin had to fork out, it's estimated around $10 million, not small change by any means. And uh, the, the US government has stepped in and actually said that this is not a good idea. Obviously it's done already, but uh, not sure what the implications are long term. For, for Garmin there, and I mean, the, the financial cost is also huge. So um, well, well put there, Darren. So any, anyone in the audience, any questions, or just input, thoughts, experiences? Hi, Feroz, it's uh, Damien. Um, uh, thanks very much to Ian and Darren for the presentation. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, just, I'm not a technical person per se, but I understand the technical environment to a degree. So my question is more broader. Uh, from a point of view of uh, what you presented, uh, guys, I think it's, it seems that if you follow the, the 3 to one process and take all the precautions, uh, it's highly unlikely that you could be compromised, right? Uh, but having followed all these steps from what you've seen and so forth, and if a company had to follow them to the letter of the law, uh, what are the chances of, being, of not being able to recover in the case of uh, an attack? Uh, from the experience that you've had so far? That's the first question. Second thing is, um, how do you commercialize your offering and your services to your clients? That's probably a question more for Feroz perhaps, but I'll leave it to you guys to decide. Thank you. Yeah, so do you want me to take the first question? Go for it. Sure, thank yeah, you. Yeah, sure, okay. So, um, I don't, so the three to one rule is sort of general practice. Um, through the IT community, but I don't know if in, in my slide I mentioned a zero, right? And this comes in with our sure backup, sure replica. So all of those backups that sit in the different locations, right? So the three different copies, two different media, one being offsite, we can run sure backup tests, so automated tests to ensure that these backups are recoverable. And we can do this as an automated process and we can run this daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, whatever your requirement is from that. So that then adds in the zero at the end of the three to one. So we have three copies of data, two sitting on two different types of storage, one being off site and zero errors on all copies. So just, just to add to that, um, Ian also mentioned that, um, you know, the ransomware attacks are intelligent enough in some cases to, to get access to your um, off site backup repositories. So even though we guarantee the recoverability of those of those uh, workloads, um, they still at threat unless you have something like um, an Amazon S3 immutable function or, or leveraging uh, the immutability feature from uh, one of the hardware vendors. 
So, so if I can just add to that as well, I mean, the, what you've said is that um, you've got the one, uh, the three to one, and I like the the zero part as well, which means checking if the if the backups are working, because it's one thing having a spare in your car in a tire, and when you have a flat, you do realize your flat is also flat. I mean, your spare is also flat. If you know what I'm saying, you know, it's it's kind of a my my backup plan isn't working. So your spare tire regularly is good practice so that you don't have surprises. In the same way, you should be testing your backups regularly. And uh, I know the biggest pain for a lot of customers are how do we test those backups? Do we manually boot them? How do I go through? Uh, we've got one customer that's got 800 VMs. I mean, how do, you, how do you test 800 VMs in a reasonable manner apart from employing somebody permanently to do that? Even then, I don't even think one person gets get through it in a month. So, so having that automated, I think, adds a lot of value. But the other thing that came out now from this conversation is the fact that if there is a zero threat, it's been backed up already because we all know that the breach happens way before the incident, right? The incident happens today, but you may have been breached three months ago already. So that threat is living in your environment and restoring a backup can also give a new life to that threat. It can re it can kick off again. So so you've got those kind of issues as well. And and the concept of being able to go into the backup and extract the threat, you know, and, and then restore is also it's also quite credible. Um, Damien, your, your second part of your question was around how do we commercialize a service or how do we offer it? So there's various components of what we do. And uh, and, the, and the first part is we, we build and design solutions for customers and then implement it so that you can maintain and run them, right? And and that is on the various tiers of architecture based on best practice, et cetera. And we've got numerous references for that. The, the, the second part is how do we extend that beyond your infrastructure framework? And, and that we can do uh, through experience. Rian has been involved in many of these projects and so as other engineers to take it to a hosted environment and that could be to an, an Amazon or it could be to a private cloud offering. We, we, we've got one within our family of companies that's 100% subsidiary called FirstNet where we provide that not only as a backup location but as a DR service which talks to the third level which says that I don't only want to be able to store this somewhere but when something hits the fan, how do I keep my company working? How do I keep it running? So within our data centers, and they're geographically spread, we're able to bring up those VMs into production through a DR plan so that your business can continue. And, and, and that extends it. And then lastly, just to cap that, is if you don't have the resources to do it yourself, we can offer that as a managed service as well. So that all you do is look at the reporting and the, and the KPI measurements and the service levels, but the back end is being managed by us. I'm not sure if those questions will all been answered for you, Damien. No, thanks, uh, Prabhupada. I think they, to a large degree, yes. Uh, more of the details we could take offline with them. Thank you. For sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, anyone else with questions? So, so while while we're waiting, maybe people are thinking. I see Leandro just lit up. Yeah. Um, just one quick question: the uh, the beam immutability. Um, is there something that only goes online? Or is this something you're going to use on your local backups? Um, uh, the reason I'm asking this is um, looking at a place as Cromco, we know it as lucky as a lot of the guys that sit in the metropole areas. It has got um, 100 megs and 200 megs of five infrastructure coming in, and they only got one vendor on our side coming in, which is open surf at this stage. So uh, at this stage, there is a bit of uneasiness regarding um, doing backup to the cloud, what if, uh, or even storing <coughs> virtual machines in the cloud. Um, but if open serve goes down and you've got no connectivity, you know, all those type of questions and uneasiness that surround it. But I just want to know, can you apply Veeam um, immutability to um, local backups or not? I'm happy to take that answer if, if, if you're fine, yeah. <clears throat> morning, everyone. I hope you guys are having a good morning. Um, to answer your question there around the immutability functionality now, Yes, we understand it's it's obviously an AWS integration uh, that specifically, but there's other ways and means how you can sort of like treat that. I think you know Ian mentioned a little bit around the storage snapshots functionality, which is over and above the network layer, which ransomware loves to function within. So layer four to layer seven. Um, with that said, when you do have that integration on a primary snapshot integration, and you do take the snapshots, it, it somewhat sort of like goes beyond the file extension, which ransomware loves to target. I mean, like ransomware understands all too well what Veeam's file extensions is 
when it comes to local backup repositories, et cetera. But when there's a snapshot lying within an actual storage device, Beam doesn't necessarily have insight into that. So with that said, you can then leverage the snapshot functionality to then restore data, fully app aware, as well as build even you know onto a data labs and use that snapshot to function VMs and start them up on, on an actual data lab. So there is an actual immutable, immutability functionality locally for that matter, um, if that maybe answers the question. <clears throat> very well thank you yeah so, yeah, so just, just uh, yeah okay just to add, i just wanted to add um um it, you can buy you can buy on-prem s3 targets um there are some vendors that, that give you a physical object device some of those have um immutability uh, as well as a feature so it doesn't have to be s3 cloud public and again uh, like rian said source side um, additional copies, right? So on 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 the storage layer is is also um, a great defense, and uh, a sneak peek in our version 11, uh, which comes out in a few months, we will have um, Linux-based immutability. So you could run spin up a Linux-based backup repository, and you can enable the immutability flag on files with inside the operating system. I think, sorry, and maybe also to, 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 to add, just to sort of like extend the conversation a little bit. So, you know, you, 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 went, you went through the DDoP appliances as well, you know, extra growth store ones. There's a few obviously vendors out there with these DDoP appliances that you can also locally put down. Those guys are also have now realized ransomware is obviously quite a threat. So they're building and they're designing these DDoP devices to have different tiers like a performance tier and a retention tier and then they put that lock on the actual retention tier built into the actual device itself so that's another way maybe to sort of like treat these ransomware um, threats that's it i think the, the the key is just to ensure that one of those copies is either air gapped or immutable mm -hmm. thank you cool um, any any other questions? Or if if I could ask the audience a question, perhaps, and um, and 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 ask you the question around uh, remediation plans. So, if any of you have remediation plans for a threat, you know, if you have a breach or something, do you have plans in place? Um, have you tested those plans? Just a general question to the audience. Um, please let us know what you've done. Okay, no volunteers on that. Uh, I think maybe to simplify the question um, mm -hmm. is, you know, the question really is when, when, when last have we tested our backups? I know Ian mentioned you need to test it every month, but I think, um, you know, and I maybe know that not a lot of customers out there really do test their backup every month. So, so, so with that said, is the functionality then implemented in the actual environment, something like Sure Backups, which is really an automated process and it kicks off maybe at night time and it kicks out a nice little report saying that my data integrity is actually in place, tested and working. And that report then can obviously go to business, right? It's really not a long drawn out process that needs to be implemented. It's something that's there, it's available. But what I've realized is more from a technical perspective and when I do these implementations is that people don't necessarily and customers don't leverage data labs and Sure Backups and it's there built into the product I mean, it, it's pretty much from 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 standard onwards. You can you can leverage some of these functionalities. Um, if you're going a little bit more into the enterprise, then obviously you would look at enterprise version upwards. I don't want to go too technical with licensing, but I mean it's really built into the product, so we should be leveraging these things, 100%. Thank you, thank you, Rian. Any any questions from the audience there? So so okay, Damien. Yeah, for, sorry, uh, uh, maybe uh, the stupid question, like you say, <laughs> you know, uh, maybe I'll, no, I'll attempt it. No stupid questions, eh? only stupid answers. <laughs> okay, maybe. So looking at that from a perspective of uh, end user, right, talking about the question that you just raised now about the backups, you know, and one of the things that the team have mentioned is that it's the integrity of the backup because those, those uh, how to say, viruses could be on, the, on those backups already in advance, right? From a practical perspective, you know, how, how, I mean, just when you do the checks and you do all these things to verify and check the, the backups, how, how sure are we that we are, we are covering everything, that something is not in there that we may have missed because these uh, 
hackers are becoming more smarter by the day, like you say, the formal companies and enterprises and so forth. So what, what confidence do we have as business that, you know, there's something that's not embedded in there, perhaps that could come back later and put us in the bum? Ian, uh, do you want to take it or Rian? Yeah. Yeah, I can I can take it. Um, so, you know, I, I I mentioned just Secure Restore, which is the ability to to plug into your current AV product and scan the backup before we put into production. OK, but this is this is sort of a reactive rather than a preactive a proactive approach. So what Veeam also has is something called data API, right? And so what data API is the API endpoint sitting in the backup repository. And what we allow customers to do is actually run API requests against the backups and bring up all these backup copies, either mounted or in whichever fashion, and then plug into security products and scan through historic data sitting in backup before we even attempt restore. So this could be um, more proactive than reactive, essentially. So we could, you know, quarterly just do um, scans into our backup repository, actually accessing data with inside the images with whichever security product you choose um, and ensure that there is no vulnerabilities or security risk with inside the backup images. And, you know, the secure restore is like, okay, we're doing a restore now, but I'm not sure of the integrity of the data. Let's do an AV scan into production so that's more reactive in, in, in my my approach yeah does that does that make sense or give guidance yeah to a degree it does yeah. thank you maybe we need to deep dive that uh, separately damien just to understand if uh, there's maybe something more specific that you need to understand happy to do that uh, another question that's, that's come now in our discussions, I mean, we're all talking about the backup, the backup, the backup, the restore, the integrity, et cetera. But in reality, how often would customers need to, to back up? I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's an important question. How often do we do it or should we do it? Ian, Rian? I'm happy to take that. I think um, it, it really depends on obviously the, the actual data, right, for the business. So, so we have different workloads within every single organization. Uh, there's obviously the SQL workloads, uh, SAP, ANA, Oracle, et cetera, which is a little bit more important than, you know, your file server, um, just as, a, as an example. So it's really determining from business itself. Normally business has um, a RTO or RPO to at least give us an idea of how fast one should be able to recover if something had to go wrong uh, or if disaster had to strike. So it really de it depends on the on the actual workload. Um, how often we can back up is is really um, continuously. So so depending of on on the actual design itself, um, without going too technical, obviously in terms of how it was layout and constructed, the architecture, um, it really depends on how often we would be able to do backups. But I think for 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 the organization itself it's really important that they define and that we as technical um, solution specialists that do the designing on the solution that piggyback on top of the actual business requirement in terms of how often data needs to be backed up now sometimes customers do have already a layout or an overview of how often data need to be backed up maybe once a day maybe every four hours then it's fantastic we can just tap into that but sometimes we need to help them define that in terms of obviously the workload itself and the design around the actual beam solution so it really depends, um, but Veeam is able to continuously back up the data. Granted, obviously, the architecture is in place. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? I've, I think I've got one more on my side that is uh, uh, pending, but I'll, let's see. In the audience side, uh, have you gotten the feedback you needed or input? Or is anything else still missing? I just want to say one last thing quickly. Um, Chromco had a ransomware attack. Um, a few years ago, um, and I think the strategy that we had on the servers where we um, made sure, you know, not, not everyone got access to everything on on the file storage server. So we've got this small little silos that we managed, um, which a certain user will have access to, and only uh, we were very careful when we did shares to anyone. And what happened was the one user's account was compromised, and all the files obviously got um, encrypted, um, his, his files. And, um, but at the end of the day, due to uh, um, 
passwords and everything being set on other places and shares on the network, um, the ransomware was unable to attack that. So, um, so looking at Veeam to help you with backups, that's the one thing, but uh, another thing people need to keep in mind, I think, is, is the security, how you share files, uh, because that can be the starting point mm -hmm. for good building blocks. Yeah. So just just to, to, to give some more information there, um, you know, to, to deploy a zero trust model um, is ideal. And I did show a slide of where you separate the backup infrastructure so that we can split the different components. So if an account is compromised, you know, the, the cyber criminals don't have access to everything in the infrastructure. Um, you know, stuff like conditional access, um, third party tools that can 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 observe um, logging and permissions and maintain that type of security structure with inside the infrastructure. One of the, the worst um, or one of a, a, a common mistake that is done is a single account that has access to everything like a guard account that has, you know, administrative access to all the different components because that one engineer manages exchange, he manages backups, he manages storage, and he just has a single account. If that one account is compromised, I mean, then the cyber criminal has access to the entire infrastructure. And this is something that you know, comes with education, training, uh, using a zero trust model, multiple different accounts, only assigning the permissions that are specifically required rather than let's just give him admin because then he'll be able to do it. Rather, you know, zero trust model, just give the permission so he can do the function that he needs to do. So, um, Ian, you've, uh, I think a lot of the, the threats that we spoke about is um, on premise. How secure um, would our workloads be or our um, information be if we are using Office 365? Shouldn't Microsoft take care of that? Yeah, so. Similar. Um, I, I, you know, when I did an Office 365 presentation, there's a video that I show um, where, again, phishing email uh, to a 365 account. You click on the link because it says your password is expired. You need to update it. It takes you to a 365 page, which is fake. User puts in his credentials, and that's suddenly the hacker, you know, gets feedback from the phishing site with the user's credentials. Hacker logs in, can encrypt OneDrive, can encrypt mail in the mail folder, um, can encrypt you know, SharePoint data. The thing is that Microsoft is not making additional copies for you. They are giving you retention and archive functionality. So you have copy one that's in the mailbox. When you delete it, it goes to deleted items. And when you archive it, it goes to archive. When you delete it out of deleted items, it goes to sort of a, a, a hidden recycle bin that you can put it back into deleted items. It's the same copy moving, you know, across these different tiers. When a hacker breaches a 365 account and encrypts all of this data or steals this data, it's that same copy. So whether you try to pull it from recycle bin, it's still encrypted. Whether you try to, you know, you try to bring it out of archive, it would still be encrypted. So that's where Veeam fills the gap, we're creating an additional copy for you so that we can replace uh, the, the compromised data. So this is a copy of your entire mailbox, right? Whatever contents is, not your mailbox, your account, actually, 365 accounts, exactly. like you mentioned, is OneDrive, and OneDrive is becoming more and more popular. We've seen that in business as people trans uh, move away from, from on-prem based heavily architectures and move some components into the cloud. The common thing to go and should have gone already is your mailbox. I mean, that should have gone a long time ago as a service. And OneDrive is moving the SharePoint together with uh, Teams, obviously on the front end, back in the SharePoint. And, uh, and that's a very valid point. If I can just touch on that as well, I mean, there's an entire security conversation around supporting the prevention as well. And, and we're talking a lot about the recovery and that's a, that's a key point around your Office 365 account. But, we also have to look at what tools get put into place to prevent this and, 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 and tools are not bulletproof either. And, and the analogy often used is uh, security is like an onion, you know, with layers. And for those of you who small kids, I always remember Shrek when I make that statement. Um, if anybody's got small kids, you'll know that. So, so the, the whole point being is that you've got multiple layers of security at home in the same way you should have in your company. So, so you might have a gate in front, uh, you might have a garage door, uh, burglar bars, uh, you know, beams in the garden, electric fence, 
uh, beams in the house, or not rather beams in the house, but alarm in the house, as well as um, as other means of deterrence. I don't know what they would be, maybe a dog, um, you know, or just a vicious family member, um, whatever <laughs> whatever you have. So, so in the same way, your security needs to be layered as well. And so we've got to look at the tools you put into place as well to manage that. So things like firewalls, and we know most people work from home at the moment. So firewalls are great, but they're not the solution. And that firewalls could be uh, around your data center and your 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 edge. I mean, both both becomes relevant. Uh, your AV products you use combined with ransomware and malware protection becomes important. Those things look at trends on your servers as well. So if they find they start using intelligence and AI, if they start seeing strange behavior on your server even with file creation or five file movements that are, are, are suddenly random, it will start locking down services as well. And because they talk to each other, then all the clients on your network will know as well, um, you know, in terms of managing that. So there's a lot of tools there and, and training in users. I mean, the weakest point is still the user, right? Um, something as simple as picking up a, a USB stick in the in the driveway or in the parking lot and going, actually, you know, maybe I should check what's on here. You know, inquisitive to kill the cat. Um, you know, that's always a risk. So uh, that that that's another point of discussion. And then how do we train users? You know, you said the policies, you do training and users still make a mistake. It, it happens, it happens every day still. Uh, and how we do that is, for example, a lot of our AV products, the advanced one, allows for user training as well. So we'll set up mock phishing exercises that will look real. I mean, you know, when I get an email from APSA about my bank account, I, I know it's a problem because I don't have an APSA bank account. But when I get one from another bank, you know, I have to read it twice and make sure it's not a threat or is it relevant. And uh, through that knowledge, you know, it's about all about the exercise. And, and if you practice and uh, what it does, it creates a report where the users are, are, are making mistakes so that you can go back and retrain people. They're forced to do some online training. So, um, you know, all in all said, I think that area is a complete discussion on its own. I mean, this is not that discussion, but it relates, obviously. So I just wanted to put this out there as well, if that question is still um, lurking in people's minds. Yeah, and for, for Rose, just to, to add to that, I mean, pre-COVID, when everyone was in the, in the office, you had control of the security protocols with inside your infrastructure. You had your enterprise-grade firewalls, intrusion prevention, you know, you had security on your, your LAN network. I mean, you, 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 the users sitting inside of that network, you were comfortable um, with, you know, and you had less threats. Now, you know, working from home, you don't have control over the user's web or WPS password on his Wi-Fi. I mean, it could be one, two, three, four, five, six. You know, you don't know that. Um, yeah. You don't have access to what he's plugging into the laptop, what he's visiting, you know, if he's downloading movies, you know, a lot of these free sites are the ones harboring most of the malware anyway. Example, like Feroz said, plugging in the USB, being inquisitive, it could be uh, your child's friend gave them copies of movie on a, movies on a flash disk and you plug it into your work laptop and now you've breached a device, right? And that device working from home has VPN access into your infrastructure and suddenly they're bypass all firewalls, everything is, you know, highway access into the infrastructure. This is your, you know, this is your attack vector is so large right now because all the customers, all your users are, are remote. So it is something that's become more of a concern, you know, and I think the way that users will work going forward into the future is going to stay this way. I don't think it will ever be, we will all fully return. Um, and that's my opinion, but I think that's, that's what the general consensus is. Agreed, Ian, absolutely correct. Um, from a timing perspective, we, we've allocated another 12 minutes. We, we are still, um, I just want to check if anybody in the audience has got any specific questions, maybe just sharing knowledge or experience or just uh, something that's still uh, confusing or needs clarity. Okay, not, not too many questions today. Okay, see us lit up. Hi, sure. Yeah. So maybe just not a question, just a comment, and then it relates back to the, the testing of your backups. So there's also, I think, and, and maybe you can shed some light on this uh, aspect of how well do you test your backups. So it's easy to, to recover one file and saying now my backup is, is in order. But is there any standards surrounding that 
what you should the amount of, of how in depth should you, should you test your backup? Is it, is it always a whole system backup, file level backup? Um, well, what's the standards? What's the, the, the advice? I'm happy to take that one in. <clears throat> I think uh, to, to, to answer the question, yes, it's, it's, it's obviously one thing, maybe just restoring a single file from a backup. But uh, as, as Ian mentioned with the data labs itself and the sure backups, there's, there's a very fixed configuration that goes with that that's quite advanced. So, so you, you have the option to actually specify in terms of the actual category for the server. Is this an actual DNS server? Is it a SQL server? Um, is it maybe an Oracle server? And with that said, Veeam has built in tests that it does against the actual application when the operating system boots up. So it goes quite advanced. It doesn't just test the actual file restore. It tests the actual application. It does a network test, heartbeat test, a few other application tests that it does over and above that as well to make sure that the actual operating system is functional fully and it's not just a file restore. So it goes quite a bit advanced um, with the actual correct configuration that goes with that. Thanks. Yeah, also just, just to add, I mean, you would, um, as a backup admin, if you restored a SQL server, how would you determine if it's um, if it's successful? You would obviously have a SQL DBA login and run a query or check if the database is mounted and online. You know, so those are different uh, stages that that you would classify. Okay, that SQL server or application is recovered and is successful. So we can tie that into what Rian said. So you specify this is a SQL workload when we're running the show sure backup test, and it will test against SQL's application. But additionally. If the DBA wants us to confirm that it can run this specific query, we can add that into the test. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your questions, Sia. Any anything else on your side, maybe that's uh, still concerning? No, I'm good, thanks. Thank you. I, I was just thinking about your comment driving around with flat tire. Um, <laughs> you don't want to get caught with your pants down. Yeah, and, and I mean, we, we, we've, and to extend that, we, we've partnered with Veeam now many, many years ago when, when they were still a, a relatively small company. Now they're a billion dollar company. Um, you know, so, so at that stage already, we, we learned that, that Veeam brought something very different from other solutions in the industry, and there were some very good brands around for many years. But the innovation that came from Veeam um, is really what, what attracted us to it because of that flexibility and the testing of the backup so you don't get manual intervention and, and other things. And, and, and that has really worked well for us and our customers. So um, with experience and hundreds of customers later, we, we, we've, we've known Veeam to always deliver what we need to deliver so that you don't have that flat tire syndrome, i.e. the spare being also flat. And it, it depends on the design, obviously, the architecture, the best practice, and 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 it's an engagement with a with a customer and our engineers to get it right. Feroz, I was just looking at uh, Fred's comment. Um, so he says he's looking forward to uh, the assessment or the health check that that uh, Rian's going to do in that environment. So I'm I'm assuming that's something that you can offer to to all of your customers and and maybe worthwhile to everybody on the call today to just uh, have a look at that environment and um, determine, you know, um, how mature are you guys in terms of protecting against these, these type of threats? Absolutely. Thank you, Darren. So, so we, we, we can do a Veeam assessment or a backup assessment, you know, in terms of uh, engaging the partner, understanding uh, your business, understanding your requirements uh, from a backup and a, a DR slash business continuity perspective. We've got the skills for that. Uh, and those those assessments, depending on, on what level we need to go to, uh, can bring back the reporting so that we understand where you're at in terms of your overall readiness. Uh, it's something we do for customers uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, and, and where those reside, what's the best practice, um, what's the best location from a cost point of view. You know, is it is it uh, archive data? Is it uh, data that needs to be accessed on a regular basis? Um, do you need that to be online, uh, remote from your site? another geographical region or whatever the requirements might be. So we're able to fully understand those factors and uh, it's open for discussion with anybody on this call. I mean, we'd be happy to engage and chat about it. 
Also, maybe just to add to that for us, uh, the, the actual assessment itself. So, so for us, yes, it's one thing doing the actual assessment and looking at the environment and infrastructure and making sure that it's set up according to best practices. But, you know, where do we go from there? So there's an actual remediation process that follows the assessment where we guide the customer, we tell the customer we can make it sort of like use of certain functionality within the, within the environment, such as data labs and sure backups, which is something that's not often set up in environments and how are we going to get there? We do a little bit of a phase approach with the customer and we sort of like guide them along the line. Um, I mean, it's one thing pointing out the mistakes, but it's, it's another thing addressing those, those shortfalls and seeing how we can better the infrastructure actually. That's just that's something extra we had there. Awesome. Okay, uh, if, if there's no more questions, and uh, I'm going to give another minute or two, and I don't know if anybody else from the team uh, wants to input any other, other information, uh, then we'll close up. So what we will do is we've got Jolene on the call as well. Jolene's a marketing manager. Uh, we rely on extensively and Veeam in this instant to help pull these things together. So I want to extend thank you to them as well. Uh, Rian as well from our team, Darren, uh, Russell's also on the call somewhere. Um, and, and our customers obviously that have attended, uh, I'm hoping that you got value out of it. I mean, that's the objective here. It's not a, a death by PowerPoint conversation. It's meant to bring value to you and, uh, and, and for you to take back to your business and make it better. Um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll send back a copy of the slides to you. And we're happy to share the video content as well to you as long as we ask you to respect the distribution thereof so that it remains within the audience. And uh, invite you to engage and have a chat if there's a business need or, or you just have some doubt in your mind, we'd be happy to, to open up a discussion.